This months edition of Frontier Unlocked is one of the most significant info drops that Frontier have ever delivered in connection with Elite Dangerous. Alongside the introduction of the Type 8 and some new pre-built ships there's a complete overhaul of the engineering system on its way very soon. In this video we'll break down all the details and just what it means for the future of the game. The information that Frontier announced this month equates to very much a two parter. One part involves the Type 8 arriving in the game alongside some new pre build ships in the ARK store. The second and for my money the far more significant and important part of the Frontier Unlocked equation are the details of the long promised and much anticipated rebalance to engineering in the game. Going forward Frontier are changing the naming scheme of their updates to the game. The currently functional and not very informative numbering scheme has delivered updates 16, 17 and 18 etc. Future updates will be named according to the headliner feature of the update. With that in mind then the next major update to the game is to be called the Type 8 update. All of what I'm about to talk about is in that update and it will be coming to the game in one weeks time on Wednesday the 7th of August. I'll cover off the ship details first and then we'll dig into what's happening to engineering. So the big ship news is of course the Type 8's arrival into paid early access. As with the Python Mark 2 there are two tiers of early access. The standard tier will get you a vanilla Type 8 and also unlock the Type 8 in the games shipyards. The second tier is the Type 8 version of a pre-build which is again called the Stellar Edition. The Stellar Edition will get you an A rated Type 8 with a focus on cargo capacity and shield boosters as well as a paint job and ship kit for your new boat. Alongside the launch of Lacon's Type 8 two new jumpstart packages are also being introduced. Jumpstart packages are pre-built ships that you can buy in exchange for arcs that are designed to jumpstart your space career in a given specific direction. The two latest ones are focused on long range passenger missions and bounty hunting and they feature the Beluga Liner and the Vulture respectively. The Beluga is loaded for passenger transport missions and comes with a grade 5 engineered SCO capable FSD. The Vulture will have some grade 1 and grade 2 engineered weaponry together with grade 2 engineered internal modules. Just a reminder that once purchased pre-built ships can just be deployed from a shipyard. If your pre-build is destroyed it carries no rebuy costs except for the cost of any modules that you've since added to it. You can only run one copy of the pre-build at a time but you can also sell it at a starport at any point allowing you to redeploy it again wherever you want. And in the case of the new early access ships all of the above is also true with the ships also being unlocked at the shipyards in their vanilla form for purchase with in game credits. And let's not forget the formerly early access only Python Mark 2 is going free to access from next week also and will be available for in game credits. Right then. Let's talk engineering. Without wishing to labour the point possibly the single biggest and most consistent gripe that has been vocalised by Elite Dangerous players for almost the entirety of the games existence is the word grind. When broken down to its grassroots components grind is essentially a convenient catch all word that is pitched at the game to describe the often difficult and lengthy processes involved in acquiring the materials needed to engineer ship modules and personal equipment. Any seasoned Elite Dangerous player will tell you the real currency in Elite is the mats not the credits. Quite often in order to get the materials they specifically want players will resort to re-logging in instances to farm one particular material or another literally not playing the game but just constantly logging in and out in order to recycle an instance and make the needed materials reappear again for collection. Such is the rarity of some materials. This is quite obviously not what Frontier intended with material gathering but I have to admit that I have used this method myself on more than one occasion as unpleasant as it is just to get the job done inside my own often limited playtime. 
Frontier have made attempts to alleviate the perceived grind in the past back in the good old days of yore when ship engineering first launched scooping up a material meant you got just one of those things not the current three and there was no such thing as a material trader. If that sounds horrendous that's because it was. The promised and much anticipated current generation of engineering rebalance has been a long time coming. I think that's fair to say. I also think too long coming is a fair criticism as well. However it is very nearly here now and without having had the opportunity at the time of recording to properly test it out I have to report that I am, cautiously, very optimistic indeed about what Frontier are about to implement. So without further delay this is what you can expect. First things first then, engineering comes in two distinct flavours, ship and on foot. The rebalance isn't just looking at one of the two engineering disciplines, it touches heavily on both. I was very very pleased to hear that. It's clear from reading the notes sent from Frontier that their philosophy for rebalance was very simple and in broad terms it equates to the following. Firstly, across both disciplines FDEV are significantly increasing the amount of materials that you can gather from instances and POIs and from mission rewards. For ship engineering specifically they are looking to eliminate the random nature of engineering roles and for Odyssey on foot engineering specifically the amounts of materials needed have been reduced. Those are the broad headlines but we can also put some finer detail on that. We'll start with the Thargoid War. Once the update drops any contributions made in taking back a Thargoid controlled system or a system that is suffering from Thargoid invasion will reward grade 4 and grade 5 materials that can then be used to trade down to whatever else you might need at one of the galaxy's many material traders. The material rewards will be delivered based on a tiered system similar to the ones that we're used to with community goal rewards. With the tiers being bottom 25%, top 75% and top 25%. Two materials are picked at random from each material category so raw, encoded and manufactured giving a total of 6 different types. For the bottom 25% you'll receive 18 materials in total, the top 75% will get 60 materials and the top 25% will get 120 materials. The counting of contributions right across the Thargoid warscape begins when the update drops. So if for example you were to make a minor contribution to every system under control and invasion you'll get a continuous rain of 18 G4 and G5 mats every time a system is liberated. That however is just the start. As I mentioned in the summation at the start of this FDEV are increasing the amount of materials available right across the board from various sources not just adding them to the Thargoid war. On the subject of ship engineering specifically as one example in the current system at a grade 5 farming location such as a high grade emission POI you might expect to scoop up between 3 and 6 materials in total. Frontier will be increasing the amount of items that can be scooped up at these POIs to the degree that that 3 to 6 range is transformed into something between 30 and 100. Just to be clear each item that you scoop will still yield 3 mats but the number of scoopable items at a POI will be significantly increased giving a much much larger material yield at a given POI. Additionally you can expect to find more canisters at crashed anaconda sites and even the notorious Jameson's crash site will have additional sources to scan as well once the update arrives. Material mission rewards will also be getting a significant boost right across the board. Depending on the mission type and the material being rewarded you could see up to 24 units of a given material being rewarded for a mission. To put that into perspective currently the typical material reward from a mission is between 3 to 5 individual mats. That's a huge increase. 
As for the ship engineering process itself, at the intro to all this I mentioned that FDev were keen to eliminate the random nature of engineering roles. I'd imagine most of us have been there at some point or another. You're really keen to eke out every last drop of performance from a module that you can, you're in the engineering workshop and there's 2 pixels worth of dead space between the progress wheel and the end stop and you're rolling and you're rolling and your G5s are going down and down and you end up chewing your own knees as a coping mechanism. Brace yourself with the next update Randomius has been banned from the engineering bay. There's a sliding scale of how many spins it will take to engineer something based on your previous grade with that engineer but the takeaway is that it is no longer random. You'll always know exactly how many mats you'll need to get the precise performance you're after out of a given specific upgrade. As an example if you're at grade 5 rank with an engineer then one spin will get you grade 1. 2 spins will get you grade 2, 3 spins grade 3 and so on. If you're less than grade 5 it will take initially more spins to max it out but I'll say it again it's going to be predictable. It will no longer be random. On the subject of Odyssey changes FDev have described the changes they're making as quote a lot more extensive unquote. The unlock requirements for the engineers Wellington Beck, Kit Fowler, Hero Ferrari and Yarden Bond have all been reduced. Wellington Beck will now need just 15 materials in total to unlock down from the current 25. Fowler, Ferrari and Bond which sounds like an awesome firm of lawyers will now require just 5 of their respective materials to unlock. In the wider backdrop of Odyssey Engineering Frontier say their goal was to allow players to use multiple suits properly rather than feeling the need to focus on just one suit due to how challenging to accumulate Odyssey materials currently are. With that being the goal then Odyssey Engineering Blueprints will have their material requirements reduced and as with ship based engineering the material rewards for Odyssey missions will be boosted as well. At the time of going to press more specific numbers on cost reduction or boosts in material rewards were not available but we'll be testing as soon as we have access to a build and we'll update on this channel with our findings. To facilitate the collection of materials from Odyssey settlements alongside these changes the base material carrying capacity of unengineered suits has been significantly raised. This is particularly noticeable on the Maverick suit where the capacity has been raised as follows. Goods capacity has gone from 15 to 40, assets from 30 to 60 and data from 10 to 20. The Artemis and Dominator have had their capacity similarly boosted and you can see those numbers on screen now. As you can see in most cases spread across the 3 suits the capacity has at least doubled. This could mean that settlement raiding will now mean a lot more time actually raiding and a whole lot less time running back and forth to a waiting SRV or ship particularly in the Maverick suit. Conversely it could also mean that the capacity of the suits has been upped to accommodate an increased quantity of materials that are available from raiding a settlement. I'm kind of hoping for the latter. It remains to be seen then what all this equates to in real galactic terms. I've always found that to a large degree that the current material availability and requirements have stood between me and my desire to experiment with different ships, builds and weapons in the game. I'm really hoping that barrier is about to be swept aside. Here we were honestly surprised by how high the numbers are that FDev are quoting as examples when it comes to material availability both at POIs and as mission rewards. How often those quoted higher numbers come up will be fascinating to see. Frontier have had to find a balance between materials still being valuable sought after commodities and them falling like rain as you play. 
Too much in one direction could see engineering becoming a chore and an impediment to just playing, accessing some content and plain old fashioned enjoying the game. If it swings too violently in the other direction then materials could lose their inherent value and commanders will be less incentivized to play missions, oftentimes unknowingly driving systems like the BGS and Powerplay. Somewhere in there Frontier have also to make sure that the time poor can actually utilize the available engineering systems, seeing real progress in their character and gameplay. Players also need to feel that they can go toe to toe with commanders that have more time available to them or that the content they are looking to engage with or discover isn't locked behind an immovable time wall. This is, I suspect, particularly important with the changes that we're about to see with the introduction of Powerplay 2.0 in September. In recent times there's been some important changes to the game and it's easy to miss the overall pattern when these changes are seen in isolation. In the last few months we've seen the tools needed in the Thargoid War made more accessible to everyone, the introduction of brand new ships to the game after a years long drought, sweeping changes to the pace of intra system travel with the introduction of supercruise overcharge, arcs store jump start ships that act as a pointer and a leg up in a given direction rather than a pay to win system and the changes to engineering that Frontier have detailed today. With all this taken in context it seems very apparent to me that Frontier are looking to achieve the following appeal to and retain newer players, re-engage and bring back players that have put the game down particularly since Odyssey, encourage and retain the many people still playing the game, inject much needed cash into the game to keep it a viable business proposition for the company to continue to expand upon and overall improve the flow and pace of the entire game without decimating or moving away from its core tenets of scale, scope and depth. No easy task but if FDev have been successful it would be hard to argue against all of these being a very good thing indeed for the health and longevity of the game going forward. Will you be picking up a Type 8 in early access? Will you be trying out the Python Mark 2 for the first time? And what do the announced changes to engineering mean to your personal game experience from here on? Let us know in the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video be sure to like and subscribe so that YouTube shows you all our content and if you'd like to support our work here at the Burr Pit you can also join our Patreon. Links to that and everything we've talked about in this video you'll find linked below. That's it for now. Thanks very much for watching. We very much look forward to seeing you next time.